what's up guys welcome back alex here from again therapy and after seeing positive reception of my previous blade of darkness walkthrough i've decided to make another walkthrough but obviously with a different character i won't talk you through it but this time if i'll have something important to say i'll just make a quick remark hopefully you will like it as much as you liked the previous one enjoy shall fall from their sanctuaries in the heavens. Fire and smoke shall rise up until they reach the very sky. Zalam is one of the most important and ancient cities of the dwarves. The wealth of its gold seams and diamond loads was exhausted centuries ago, but those times of splendor are recalled in its well-preserved and extensive library, and its wise men are famed among the clans. In the underground passages of your home city, your tomb, strange signs and shadows have been observed. Bands of orcs menace the surrounding area with increasing boldness. So you've been sent by the elders to consult the Kazan's alarm scholars. Similar portents have occurred in the past. Perhaps answers are to be found among their ancient manuscripts. Alright, so this right here is another small introduction for the level, just a written one. Every map has one except the Tower of Sorcery for some reason and I'll try to remember to pop it up at the start of each level, but please don't blame me if I don't. I tend to forget these kinds of stuff. Also, it's not vital to read it in order to pass the game. By the gods of hell, the city has fallen. So many dead, how can this be? Thank <laughs> you. 
So when you reach here try not to forget a couple of things. The first one is the key right here for the weapon storage that we passed earlier. The second thing is the wall with the puzzle that will lead you to a potion and a round shield, which is good to have early in the game. Mirror! Mirror! 
At the start of your journey you might not want to take multiple enemies at once. Try to step back a bit and see if one of them doesn't want to cross a certain line. At this point you might want to rethink your strategy. Do you want to take a higher level weapon and perform simple attacks or do you want to take a low level weapon and perform combos and deal critical damage consequentially? I suggest taking a higher level weapon and kill every enemy with one swing. Alright, so now we face a troll, and it does have more health than average, so performing a morning star combo with your eggs might be the optimal way to deal with it.
settled on earth was destroyed, but its seed remains hidden and shall one day return. The city has been attacked and its inhabitants are gone. The corpses of a group of valiant defenders are scattered throughout its passages. In one room of the library, you found a book which speaks of mysterious brooms of power suggests that assistance could come from the world of men. Now that Kazel Zalam has fallen, all the cities of the dwarves will be on their guard. Their gates will be barred. Woe betide those like you who remain on the outside, for the dwarves will not emerge until the situation has been resolved. The only solution is to solve the whole mystery and return home as soon as possible. Tel Halaf is the principal fortress of the Knights of the Armina region. For generations, their dukes have kept the peace and ensured free passage through the district. Lord Kerman, a paladin of the Order, governs the garrison with an iron fist, holding off an ever-increasing threat from the north.
This door right here is where you can test your patience. If you're patient enough, the orc behind the door will get close to it and it will allow you to kill or severely injuring it without confrontation. Now a few words regarding the Light Edge. It's a classless high damage outputting weapon that I highly suggest picking up with any class. It can help you breeze through the first levels that you struggle to build yourself without too much effort. And the majority of the enemies will fall after a couple of hits in this map and the next one.
My lord the duke, my life ebbs away. My lord the duke has been taken prisoner. Rescue him, please. He is our one and only hope. Take this key to aid your escape and read in this parchment the final orders of my master. How the Prince of Darkness began to manipulate the primordial chaos to create a new being. And how, before it could be dominated, the being came to life and became independent of its creator. And how the Lord of Chaos was between the gods. I personally had a little trouble with this trap while playing with Negelfar because his jumping animation is very slow, so if you are playing with him try to time it perfectly or jump with a weapon to try to shorten the animation. Fortress 
has been taken by an army of malevolent orcs. However, their chief was no simple orc, but some more powerful being. His attack has not been decisive. It seems that his aim was not to conquer the castle, but to find something hidden there. Lord Kerman, a man of great wisdom and a worthy knight, has been taken prisoner. The mines beneath Mount Kelbagan form one of the main dwarf settlements in this region. Its principal sources of wealth are weapons-grade steel and the obsidian used for carving sacred objects. It is a very ancient site known to all races and peoples from the central kingdoms to the far peoples of the sea, unlike the other cities of the dwarves, which are generally secret places. Since time began, the dwarves have struggled against evil. Safe beneath the mountains, they have accumulated the wisdom, wealth and power to combat the forces of darkness. Yeah! <laughs> 
Now it would be a good idea to feel your health before entering the sign segment, because the climbing animation could be slow and the acid might kill you while you're at it. Just see how much Zoe loses when she tries it. Besides, you can get another full potion in the room itself. Mazda, the father of all things, made the primordial chaos, and of how he took part of the formless mass and separated it, creating light and darkness, giving them both life and their own thoughts. And how he rejoiced in what he had done. Finally he had company who no longer felt alone.
Overall, the Mines of Kelbigan has almost the same items that you can find in Tel Halav. It just gives you a second chance to find them. Just remember that the game is not forgiving in its nature, so in more advanced maps there are stuff that you might not find again. For that reason, try to scope everything out before you finish a level.
Upon his return from the War of the Sword, Freyr was greeted with celebration and appointed king at the base of the mountain. He took his place on the throne and reigned from the stone hall of many pillars. The mines have been sacked by an orcish army. The dwarves seem to have retreated before their arrival. The old story of Freyr, the dwarven hero, speaks of powerful weapons hidden in the tombs of Ephira. Perhaps you will find some answers there. In Ephira, the mad King Azud ordered his dwarven artisans to build a temple guarding the tomb of his wife, the great Queen Asha, and all her secrets. A few years later, when he died, he was buried in a chapel near the temple. After that, several kings of the Ishabad were buried there. The temple and the tombs were abandoned many years ago, and since then they have become famed as a place of peril. They say that many tomb robbers and other adventurers have disappeared there, giving it the reputation of an accursed spot. All the actions of the enemy seem to suggest a search for some particular object or information which they didn't find in Tel Halaf or Kelbagan. Their next target will probably be Ephira.
So this is the part where you start facing off skeletons. Now there is a hidden information but it's true for many games where you fight monsters and undead creatures. Skeletons will get extra damage from blunt weapons, while fleshy creatures will be more affected by cutting weapons. Which is the reason why I kept this spite club all this time. You want to have every little advantage you can get while playing this game.
Now that Venom Hammer might give you the impression that it's not that great by its base attack, and that is where you're wrong. The strength of every weapon is eventually measured by the strength of its combo or a special attack. As it so happens, the special weapons that are Ice, Venom and Fire have the biggest multipliers, meaning that the game takes a certain weapon's base attack and multiplies it differently for every weapon. I'm not sure about the Venom Hammer, because I have no idea where I can find the weapon's database, but I think it multiplies the attack by more than 40. Unfortunately, I'll have to keep it until level 17 before I put it into use. Until then, it will be a dead weight. There is kind of a problem for both the Sharp and War Eggs. You can see a certain name while playing and yet when you open the tab it gives you the opposite names respectively. Same goes for the Biting Eggs. When you will find it, it will appear as the Killer Eggs. Now when it comes to the War and Sharp Eggs, try to avoid them. If you open up the tab and look at the War Eggs, that is exactly the weapon you want to avoid the most. Same goes for the Combat Eggs. Both of them have a high probability to miss the target. As for the sharp eggs, you shouldn't use it because it's simply too weak in comparison to the weapons you found already. I never really tried to slash back with it and see if it shoots blanks. <laughs>
conjure you, ancient serpent, by the judge of the living and the dead, by that which has the power to send you to the icy hell of Veliskyalf. Ura Mazda, heavy of heart at the sin of his sons, the gods, withdrew himself to the far depths of the universe. And how since then he has not been seen by the Avestus, from where the wise men say he will only return at the end of time. Now I know I told you not to get close to the sharp eggs, but I just want to demonstrate its attack. It has a nice wide range, but unfortunately it doesn't work. I'm pretty sure I won't get to use it because the rest of the map is all about your blunt weapons. But for now, before heading off to finish the map, try to go to the nearby yard to pick up some more experience from the skeletons that appear there. The thing is that for now we need to gather as many experience points as we can, only after you get to about level 18 you can cool it down, because there is no much sense in leveling up beyond level 20. Just remember that the whole idea of leveling up is mostly for your health and energy pool, you need more health to withstand more attacks and energy to use stronger weapons, unfortunately none of those rise after level 20. Yeah! <laughs> 
severs and pierces all things, I am he who revisits death upon the living dead. The enemy has outpaced you once again and taken this place. Though the tombs of the king and queen have not yet been desecrated, they contain powerful weapons that will be of great assistance. Other fell creatures have joined the orcs and the trolls, undoubtedly the fruits of necromancy. Could it be that a wizard or sorcerer is behind all this destruction? The marking of the tower and the isle on the map is undoubtedly the strongest clue to the enemy's origin. Among the mountains of Zaros lies the lake of Karun, and in the middle of the lake there is an isle. In ancient times, a tower was built on the isle, creating a guarded pass between the mountains which separates the ancient realms from the deserts to the north. For centuries, the tower of the Isle of Karun was a bastion for the knights in the inhospitable and perilous lands of Zagreb. Finally, it was lost. The knights abandoned the fortress, and so the path to commerce was closed, and the knowledge of it faded from the minds of men. The map, although besmirched by an orc, clearly shows the path between the mountains which leads to the lake. So we picked the Venom Hammer and the Queen Sword by the end of the previous level. Sadly we cannot see the multipliers for the special attacks, but trust me it's there. As for the Queen Sword, the blood mark is not there for nothing. Its special attack allows you to leech life, but I recommend using it, for the most part, on bigger enemies, such as the Minotaur.
Now I missed this part on my walkthrough with Zoe, but if you guys play with her and want a new weapon, I suggest to pay a visit here. Now we have the great hammer here and I'll try to explain why you might not want to pick it up. See that special attack? That is exactly my problem with it. When you are picking a weapon, don't look at its attack power alone. Yes, it's higher than the warhammer, but is it reliable to use? Not so much. You see, weapons that have vertical attacks have higher probability to miss their targets. Remember, you're playing Blade of Darkness. What makes this game hard is the fact that enemies are not monotonic. Sometimes they can attack you from different angles, and if that is not enough, they can also dodge. Especially the knights and the dark knights, which are my nightmare. So what makes the Warhammer to one of the best and reliable weapons for the dwarf is the fact that it has a very forgiving attack. It has that pointy curve that makes a very good reach to enemies that stand far from you. And at the same time, if they dodge to your left, there is still a good chance to reach them still.
Rhaea the dwarf have concealed the stories of the gods with cunning traps. Until the day when all that is secret will be revealed. Know that when Ayana's sword was returned to her altar, six tablets were brought into being, each one marked with a rune of power. The story of the creation of history was written on them so that it should never be forgotten. To open the tomb of the Holy Sword, you will need the four great magical gems, and to obtain the power of the sword, the runes must be reunited. In 
Remember when I said I hate Dark Knights? Well, that was one of them, but in its weaker form. Usually when you encounter them, they have twice the hit points and one of the most annoying properties they've got is that they're usually equipped with a poisonous weapon. They also manage to dodge instinctively and deliver fast hits that are hard to avoid. And in case they're equipped with bows, guess what? Poisonous arrows. Yeah! <laughs> 
Now like in the tombs of Ephira, the game grants you the option to go back and fish for some experience before finishing the map. If you approach the window with the archers, you will be able to go back to the outer circle of the castle. From there, you can encounter skeletons on both the ground level and on rooftops. Sadly, due to their level, they might not grant you a level up. But still, if you are in need of potions, there is still that full potion at the start. And some minor ones as well. Yeah. <laughs> 
After defeating the enemy, Erish Kegal's life withered away from the perilous wounds he suffered in battle. His devoted friends carried his body to the temple of the goddess and entombed him there, close to the stone altar where the sword had been laid. As the shrine was closed, four beautiful gemstones magically appeared on the ground. A white opal, an aquamarine, a black obsidian stone and an amber gem in an oval shape. Each friend made a promise to keep the secrets of the gems and decided to leave signs so they could retrieve the sword and use it to destroy evil once again. visionary, or food for my worms, new courage for my slaves, a placing for my armies. fled. The malign creation of necromancy, he was no more than a minion, a serf sent by a power still greater than he. Lord Kerman, Duke of Tel Halaf, was not found among the prisoners in the tower, but there is evidence that he is held in Shartuwa, the fortress of the orcs. In the tower is a mural depicting the history of the fallen warrior, hero of the War of the Soul which speaks of the return of evil and of the sword as the only force strong enough to counteract it. If one of the four gems should be found and the sword appears, it would be of great assistance. The fortress of Shalatula was constructed by the knights of old so they could control the mountainous region of Yerevan. Many years ago, however, the knights retreated from that region. Since then, a powerful orc clan has arrived and settled there. The orcs, a people who have always been independent and strong, now serve the enemy, compelled to fight by a force more powerful than they. Yeah! 
fertile valleys of Yerevan, where they sought shelter in the tall towers of its fortress. When the day of leave-taking came, Amlak, the Archer of the Sun, strode off to his land in Orlok and settled among its steep gorges, taking with him his share of the treasure and the blue gem. Gorlon the Knight returned to his fiefdom in Sarikan and became Duke of his frozen castle where the white gem has been watched over ever since.
Alright, so when you get to this point where you see staircases and orcs, or other enemies for that matter, try to avoid fighting them on the stairs and try to lure them out into the open. You don't want to mess with an agile enemy on a staircase. Your attacks can frustratingly miss even when you're sure you managed to hit your target. And your camera can just go crazy on you while you're getting hit. That is probably the most useful tip I could give you for this map. 
The other one would be don't get dizzy by the beauty of the level design. It might just get you killed.
So now that you got the cells key, don't rush going down into the cells where the duke is located. Try to just walk around first. See maybe if you miss something along the way. And it will also grant you the opportunity to deal with a couple of extra orcs. And I mean the higher ranking orcs, the beefy ones. They can actually grant you a reasonable amount of experience. Again, at this point you have pretty much gone through half the journey in terms of leveling. So don't expect any unit to shower you with experience. That can only be somewhat true for bigger enemies such as the Golem or the Minotaur. Thank you, my friend. Although you come too late, but there is still hope, and only the sacred markings on the stones reveal the way. Come with me, let us leave this dungeon, and while we walk I shall explain to you how to recognize the signs. No! Has died. 
He was weakened by his captivity and illness, and a cruel blade sealed his fate. Nevertheless, his belief that the enemy can be stopped heartens you, and the warning about secrets and mysteries can be of assistance. However, the quest continues. The enemy is threatening the blue and white gems, which are in the keeping of the Gorge of Orlok and the Frozen Castle. Time is of the essence. One of those two should be your next objective. The Gorge of Orlok is a natural pass between the mountains that border the ancient kingdoms and the steppes of the north. In the past, these mountains formed the kingdom's most advanced line of defense, and from them departed the raids of the conquering kings towards the rich and distant northlands. However, it is now centuries since the last of those raids, and even the gorge itself is beyond the present borders of the kingdom. All manner of malign creatures now lurk among the ruins of those ancient fortifications. In the days before the war, the sword, one of the gems of the legendary Tomb of Blade was concealed there, and though its fate has now been forgotten. Welcome to the snowy beauty, the Gorge of Orlok. I'm always fond of seeing snowy levels in any game, and that one is no exception. There is something beautiful about this level, although when you get down to the details, it's really simple in its design. There are quite a few secrets here that you might find useful for pretty much every class, especially if you are playing with the Barbarian or the Knight. You can find the Ice Sword for the Knight and the Doom Axe for the Barbarian. When it comes to Zoe, you can get the Crash Bow for her. And as for the Dwarf, you can find the Ice Hammer and Medium Armor. Now I know that many players dislike the Ice Hammer, but hopefully when the time comes you will see how useful it can be. Our first stop is the crash ball for Zoe. It's pretty straightforward and the only thing I can say about this area is don't get too comfortable because there is an archer up on the wall. So watch your step.
Alright, so get rid of those two orcs, just make sure not to let them gang on you, and you got yourself a tunnel that has three items that can be easily neglected. The first one is a power potion, the second is the doom eggs, and the third is the ice sword. Just one more friendly tip, don't try to pull that lever, because it's actually going to activate a trap, which can result in your death, and that trap is located here at the entrance. So what I'm going to do is to just run straight to the ice hammer and the reason I'm going to do it is because I have a hard time handling dark nights in tight spots. Now despite all the negatives of the ice hammer it can be useful against knights. So let's just pick the hammer and see how it goes. There we go. So what exactly makes me like this hammer despite its flaws? Well you have to remember that you are playing as a dwarf, and with that you have to remember the main things that represent him. Short height, short arms and consequentially short reach, or to put it shortly, everything is short except his lifespan. <laughs> yeah, so the idea is that 
The hammer allows you to reach out for a relatively long distance, and that way if you play the patience game like the knights do, you have a pretty good card in your hand. Another good thing about it is the fact that the attack is pretty fast, so if you know how to handle it well, you can dodge just as well. This is Velia, the blue gem, the deep aquamarine, guardian of the tomb of the sword, mounted over signs of the snail and the trident, ancient coat of arms of the fisherman of the sea. Anticipating the enemy's plans, you have succeeded in liberating Velia, blue gem, set under the sign of the snail and the trident, ancient coat of arms of the fishermen of the Sea of Vinaya. Among the mountains of the Half Moon, on the pine-covered slopes of Nimrut, 
stands the Fortress of the Clouds, which guards the lands of Sari Khan. In the castle is one of the keys to the tomb of the fallen warrior. For during the War of the Sword, the men of that place fought alongside their allies, the knights. Thank you. 
Finally, we got our hands on these beautiful and reliable eggs. I highly recommend having it around you until the end, because the execution of the attack and the damage output can be mental.
The interesting part here is that you can skip the whole deal with the traps. Simply do it in the order I do it and you'll be fine. Vestas agreed to create a place where they would all live together, and how Ayana, the beloved daughter of the father, created in this world a beautiful garden filled with life, and how Angramanyu, the prince of darkness, visited his siblings and lived with them.
So the secret tunnel here has a few things, a double dash takes, a great hammer, an ice axe and a power potion. Now if you don't need any of these items I do not suggest entering there, because it can get buggy on you and you can get stuck there, meaning you cannot get out and you will probably have to restart the map. But if you still want to go there and explore and defeat the burning skeletons that appear after you take the power potion, please save the game. Do not risk with rage quitting.
This is Burr, the white gem, an opal of perfect purity, guardian of the Tomb of the Sword, mounted in crystal cut from the rock as a symbol of the purity of the eternal snows of the frozen mountains. Treachery and perfidy have reached as far as the icy fortress, and its inhabitants have fallen under the dominion of a powerful demon and lost their reason. But Burr, the white gem, has been saved and mounted in ice that retains all its purity. The oasis of Nejeb is a four-day journey into the great sand desert. A settlement of merchants flourished there and built a beautiful palace. Over the years, the warring and the decadence of the merchant rulers brought about their downfall. The oasis was abandoned by all except a few nomad shepherds. Recently, however, the enemy has established itself in this place in a bid to control access to the Rubal Jeb Desert and the volcanic forge of Shathra. So our journey continues and we are leaving the snowy regions and arriving to more sunny and exotic places. This map is absolutely stunning, I love the way it is built. But don't let the beauty blind you. From the very start we have three orcs waiting for us. And I suggest not to rush into battle but to lure them one by one. Also there are some areas that could be tricky to pass because there are well placed archers in them. So again, don't rush, take it easy, and take out your targets one by one, without taking unnecessary risks.
Alright, so this is the part where the map shows you the uglier sides it has, and not just visually, because from here on you have to make some risky jumps, run from A to B and then backwards. Also the part with the sword sign can be a bit annoying, because if you want to face the golem that is located nearby for its experience, you need to run and jump everything all over again, which overall makes this map bittersweet. <laughs>
By the way, the entrance to that chamber can be buggy, so don't enter it while running, because you can fall to your death. Darkness and wickedness overshadowed the aura of light and virtue that enveloped the earth. About the fight between Avestas and Archontes, and the expulsion of the opponents.
Alright, so we have the double mace here, which is a reasonably powerful plant weapon. And yet I'm still not going to switch it for my ice hammer. And definitely not the poisonous one. In my opinion, the swinging animation is way too slow. Given the fact that you will need to get really close to perform it, makes me have my own doubts about its usefulness and effectiveness. Plus, the ice hammer's attack is much easier to perform, so there is that. But, that's my personal opinion, you might actually find it more useful than I do. And now we arrive to a crossroad, there is the main entrance that will take you to the end of the map, the jump to the right that will have a couple of skeletons and no items, and the jump to the left with 3 skeletons but you can find a full potion, a combat sword and a poisonous steel feather for Zoe. To me it doesn't make sense taking the jump to the right because it's a risky jump, so obviously I cannot advise it. But the left path has short jumps, so it's not a bad idea to visit it.
Here, Sawan, the tireless traveller and guide to Erish Kigal, saw the light of day for the first time. And here now rests his mortal remains. Honour to his memory. For he led the heroes of the sword and accompanied the golden gem to the temple of Al Farun. And also he aided Nergal the smith in regaining the forge of Shathra, where during a short time they forged anew the mighty armor of the knights. Nergal watched over the black gem. The enemy has taken the place and knows where the yellow and black gems are hidden. Time is of the essence in your quest. The desert of Rubal Jeb is close, as is the dormant volcano under which the forge of Shathra lies. But who will get there first? When the gods wish to reward Nareem the pious for his years of service to his people, they flung from their dwelling place a sacred monolith that pierced the ground in Al Farun, causing a spring to gush forth from the dry sand with the purest and most abundant waters in the region. And thanksgiving for this bounty from the heavens, this temple and all within it was erected where Sawan the Traveler guards the yellow gem. Yeah, so I believe this map doesn't need any introduction and it's probably one of those few levels that I don't see any negatives in them. It's beautiful, it shows off the graphical engine that was used to create this game, it complements the lighting effects that the game has to offer and overall without too many complexities. But there is one thing that can set you back and that is the jumps that you need to make. Now, if you are a sword jumper like I am, you will probably have issues in that department here. That is why I'll show you a method of how to jump without risking yourself.
Alright, this is it. If you want to get the sword sign, you need to jump to a ledge, and from there to that platform that is diagonally to me. So watch carefully at what I'm about to do. <sighs> yep, it worked. So for those of you who are not familiar with that technique, I'll explain. What you need to do is to sheath your weapon, start running and then rapidly pressing the block key. Now there is a sweet spot for how often you press that key, but you should practice doing it every half a second or less between each block.
of how Ayana expelled the gods from their dwelling place and kept the earth closed to them, keeping behind her works and creatures, and how Spenta Manu watches over the earth from the sun, and Ayana dwells on the moon to watch over the night from there. From that time on then, the succession of day and night reigned over life on earth. of the sun is a fire that forges the will of his servants in the furnace of the desert. We offer you the sacred fire. Grant us the grace to contemplate your countenance.
Water is the gift of the gods, so we offer up our water on the sacrificial altar. And thus shall we contemplate the grandeur of the gods. I'm going to drop my hammer here and go for the combat axe I mentioned earlier. It's not exactly something that I want to do, but if I'll manage to throw a few hits with it, it will be extremely helpful. But that would be kind of a longer shot, because I need to get to level 18 before I can actually use its special attack. That is why this is where me and my beautiful ice baby are parting ways. A very sad day in the temple.
You had a little taste here and if you paid attention some hits just went through him. Even simple swings can miss when it comes to that axe.
Having offered you our water which gives us life and our fire which gives us valour, we offer you the measuring rod with which you will separate out the righteous and grant them access to you. Thank <laughs> you. 
This is Ryazan, the Amber Gem, guardian of the sword, the legacy of Narim, golden symbol of the sun. by the incantations of the priests was safe from the orcs and bloodthirsty trolls. 
but its sacred interior was desecrated by skeletons and the living dead. Foul creations, abominations of nature, which offended by their very existence the purity of the domain. Ryazan, the Amber King, mounted in the sacred scarab, symbol of the sun, is out of danger. In the dark times, when the gods still dwelt among men, the followers of Shathra, god of metals, and ally of Angra Manu, prince of darkness, raised a fortified temple in the heart of the dormant volcano. Centuries thereafter, the temple was fitted out as a fortress, where the great smiths of old forged the finest of weapons. Nergal, the maker, chose the safety of the volcano to preserve the black gem, the sacred obsidian. But as the years passed, the fortress fell into disuse, and the gem was forgotten. Welcome to the Forge of Shethra, the place where everyone yearns to dip you in lava, the level that made yours truly miserable. So go back from where you originally came, and you will find a 500 potion and that piece of shit eggs that made me restart this map multiple times. Guys, do not use that AX, it sucks, it's unreliable, it will let you down in the most decisive moments of battle, just stay away from it, trust me on this one, for your own safety, literally.
If you want that crown over there without the confrontation with the skeleton below it and avoiding the trap, approach it the way I do and then escape the way I will after I'll deal with that skeleton. By the way, when you go up with that lift, don't try to climb in order to speed things up. It will kill you.
If you go all the way down you will see a locked passage, that is where the fire sword for the barbarian is located. You can return by the end of the map and I'll tell you exactly when. Yeah! <laughs> 
these jumping stones can be tricky to pass. So let's try doing what we learned at the temple.
Remember that locked gate with the barbarian sword I mentioned? Make a leap of faith down here and you will find your way to the sword. followers of Shathra, allies to the demons, continued to thrive 
under the power of the cult's dark deity. Yuri Sabrig, the black spider of obsidian, has remained hidden, but now it is finally free from danger. Crossing mountains and steppes, jungles and deserts, you shall reach a secret valley where a large river runs. Close to its bank there is a temple. Only the chosen ones shall find it. For when Ayana cast her spell to expel the gods from the earth, she wanted to save her temple from desecration, and so she used magic spells to conceal it from view. Now you are in Ayana's favor. Perhaps you shall be her chosen one and prove worthy so Alright, so we picked the fire axe in the forge of Shethra and I just want to perform the attack and show you how slow the animation is. Now you need to perform three different attacks and the first thing that you think when you see how slow an attack is, is where you should put it into use. In some instances you can take a few steps back and start performing it before the enemy gets to you. But it is very risky, which is why I'll put it into use for certain enemy units. The best ones to use against are of course the slower units, the Chaos Knight, the Minotaur and no one else. I come to offer you the Amber Jewel. Please open the door for me.
I come to offer you the flawless aquamarine. Please grant me access. to offer you the white opal. Please grant me your blessing. So this is where things get a bit more complicated. You can skip a good chunk of the orc forces by shooting arrows on those triggers and you're good to go. But due to the fact that Negelfar is the chosen one, I'll go purify some evil forces. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Now I want to point out something and that would be regarding some myth that is thought to be true for this level. When the orc invasion begins you can see a certain orc with what seems to be a different bow. From what I have seen the community believes that one of the orcs is using a heavy bow. Personally I did not attempt to verify it but if you are planning on proving that, do it by killing all the archers with your bow. Because if you manage to go up there with that trick I showed you and make them swap their weapon, they will not drop it, just keep that in mind.
come to offer you the Black Obsidian Stone. Please grant me the power to take up the Sacred Sword.
treacherous Dal Gurak, servant of the shadows and worshipper of Angra Manu, hides away in his high tower of sorcery where he draws up battle plans for his army of abominable creatures. The power of the goddess has uncovered his place of hiding, and it now falls to the goddess chosen one, the Knight of Light, to defy him. Alright, we got the Sword of Light and there is something that you might want to know. If you are not going to pick all the signs of the sword, Ayana will not reveal her face and consequentially the strongest attack of the sword will not be available to you. Another thing that will happen if you neglect all the signs is that you will not be able to proceed beyond this level, which is why the Abyss is considered to be a semi-secret level. But just because you gave up on collecting all the signs doesn't mean the game gave up on you. At the end of the Temple of Ayana, you will have the opportunity to go back to the levels you didn't pick the signs. But those levels will not be abandoned. They will be infested with demons, vampires and a Chaos Knight.
and here is the secret armory of that level. The only place where you can get all the strongest equipment in the game. It's also where I'm going to bitch about the dwarven weapons. Initially I wanted to start this video with saying something like the dwarf specializes in using axes, shields and, to my great regret, hammers. Now I don't mean it as in hammers are a bad thing. I'm saying that the strongest weapon for a dwarf in the form of a hammer is a bad thing. And why is that? It's for the simple reason that the majority of the bosses to come are partially resistant to blunt weapons, especially the Chaos Lord, and I'll demonstrate it when we get there. But think about it for a second. Your strongest weapon is not effective, your second strongest, aka combat axe, aka bullshit weapon, is broken, and that leaves us with the killer axe, which is probably one of the reasons that the dwarf is the least effective character among the bunch. <laughs>
And now we arrive to the corridor of fallen heroes. Look around you and you will see skeletons, broken equipment and potions everywhere. In my opinion, these are the heroes that attempted to dethrone Dalgurak, but failed before they managed to get to him. By the looks of the equipment, it is hinted that both the Barbarian and the Amazon died trying. Now, this is the threshold between hard gameplay to extremely hard. You won't get any items after this point, which is why I strongly advise to heal yourself up and saving the game. upon the face of death. This is Mescal Amdag, the Lord of the Arcontes, the Scourge of Urbade, and the Perdition of Nippur, Master of the Thousand Dead. So I want to prove a point here. After a certain amount of damage he will be coated with an aura. It grants him resistance to light damage. He is the only one that has that kind of aura and what I want to show you is that if you wait long enough it will wear off, just like the auras from your items. It's just that on enemies the duration feels much longer. Miserable mortal, you have found me and thwarted my plans. Now at last you must die. By the power of Angra Manu, 
I invoke all evil spirits and creatures of the shadows. Finish him! you paladin with the power of the gods you have succeeded in destroying me the time has come for you to meet your destiny
Gurak's high tower of sorcery, the Chosen One crosses the threshold of the abyss, goes forth through the door of Velas Kyalf, and into the depths of the fortress belonging to the Lord of Chaos. Where he has gone, no man can follow. Only the protection of the goddess and his gleaming sword can help him. So if you noticed I managed to snatch Dalgurok's shield. If you want to get that shield as well, just stand next to him before your final blow. And when he dies, just quickly pick it up. By the looks of it, it might not look much, because it can take only 5000 damage. But you're getting it wrong. The shield has the ability to restore itself. It's indestructible as far as I know, unless you receive a hit that deals more than 5000 damage. And I personally haven't witnessed something like that.
So only a couple of bosses remain and this risky jump, so save your game and may the goddess be with you. This time that big boy has a trick up his sleeve. He's going to pound the ground and making you drop your weapon, which is why I suggest keeping the Sword of Light by your side.
And now the only obstacle that remains is the Lord of Chaos. I'm going to show you a few things. How much damage each weapon of the weapons I have can deal to him, what happens when you keep a certain distance from him, and hopefully showcase every attack he has.
And this is it. Not gonna lie, it was quite the journey. The dwarf is definitely not the easiest character to play with. I had a lot of trouble with him, especially in the jumping department, he really sucks at it, and overall feels like an unfinished character. But still we managed to do it. Hopefully you guys didn't mind me talking throughout the game, I tried to keep a balance between the gameplay itself and the verbal interpretation, and I hope you found some useful information about the game. Anyways, I'm deeply grateful for the love you showed to this game and my videos overall. If you enjoyed this one as well, please comment, please subscribe to my channel, it helps me a lot. See if you can find some more interesting stuff on the channel. And yeah, I'm Alex from Again Therapy, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys on the next one.